Well, good morning, everybody. The local time is 8.46 a.m., give or take, and we will begin our program, session B, at the top of the hour, at 9 o'clock. Thanks for joining us. Are we functional? Audio, visual, how we doing? Hey, that's good to see. Wireless microphone, all sorts of things to try. Let me say hi to some folks here. Make sure that we're uh, will work. The Night Owl from the Netherlands, Garrett, hello. Oh, we have a friend. He heard my voice. Let's say hi to these guys. Come on. You're okay. You're okay. Can we say hi to these guys? Oh, we've got a friend out here this morning, Mr. Bijou. Uh, we'd like to say good morning to you all. He's been out enjoying the morning. Lots of birds singing out here. He's been enjoying watching them. Little hummingbirds nearby. Hello, Taro from Finland and Red Deer, Alberta. Chaz from Portland. Hey, everybody's saying good morning to you, Bijou. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Oh, from Madison, Wisconsin. Holy cow. Go Badgers. Go Packers. Yeah. So are you thinking you want to go in, or you just you just heard my voice and you want to just come visit? I mean, I wish you could hear these guys' voice. Yeah, do you see? You see those that text is scrolling there. Oh yeah, I think I think we're just wanting some quality time this morning. We have 250 people. Oh okay, is that it? All right. Uh, a few more. Yes, very gifted guy. He, he can read everything, yes. Uh, Fresno County, uh, good morning. Uh, Cor uh, Quartz Mountain, did I read that correctly? Stanwood, uh, do we have more uh, folks from distant lands this morning? Not to be greedy, but Sunday mornings are always kind of fun that way. Uh, Vancouver, Washington, that's exotic. Hey! Elise in Devon, UK, and Zazu in Belgium, and Russell in San Jose, California. Michael's in Ireland. Uh, Nicola something, in Heidelberg, Germany. Hello, Dartmouth, UK, Denmark. Oh, this is so fun to see. I, I'll never get tired of this. Anarika in Finland. India. Nice mug. Oh. <laughs> I am so uh, oblivious now to this kind of stuff that I, I don't even notice. Yeah, thank you to the person who sent this over the summer. Uh, this is from the Giant Current Ripple show live stream we did last spring, and I'm a joy giver, so I was uh, enjoying the uh, smell of uh, opening a bag of Lay's potato chips. This episode of Nick from Home brought to you by... Lay's potato chips, you gotta love it. Joy giver. Uh, yeah. Let's do a quick programming note before I forget and then I'll uh, announce it at the end as well for the folks who join us a little bit later on. Long story, but I'm changing our schedule and I hope it's not a super big inconvenience to you. I realize not everybody's going to love this change, but hey, um, it needs to happen. So we are sticking with our Sunday mornings at 9. I like the time. We get so many folks from distant lands and uh, it's nice and quiet, typically in the neighborhood. 
and uh, I enjoy a nice, uh, quiet Sunday morning with you all. So we're, we're sticking with that. But the change is, I'm really tired of thinking about it, but I've been debating the whole week whether I stick with Wednesdays or not. I'm not. I'm going to Fridays at 2 p.m. So for the rest of these exotic live stream sessions, two live streams a week, that hasn't changed. But each Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific time, each Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time. So we're not doing Wednesday evenings anymore. If you're curious, there's three main reasons. I think there's extra competition for bandwidth. I mean, I'm just getting all this help and it's great, but I, my brain is full with this kind of stuff. It feels like there's more competition for traffic, et cetera, on, on the interwebs. I don't even know if that's true, but that's one reason. Another reason is it's gonna be dark most of the time, 6 p.m. here, uh, starting in just a few weeks, really. And so I like being out in the backyard and I wanna use natural light and with Fridays at 2 p.m. and Sundays at 9 a.m. I'll hopefully be out here, even if it's cold, I'll be out here most of the time, unless it's, I guess, incredibly windy or something. Reason number three, I'm not flipping you off, uh, Liz will still be at school. So she's ecstatic about that. So she doesn't have to tiptoe around the house or whatever, or listen to my drone out in the backyard. So she'll still be at school Fridays at 2 p.m. So she's into that as well. So that's enough reason right there for me to change. So I'm sorry about the change. From this point forward, Fridays at 2 p.m., Sundays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'll read your comments later and see if there's massive amounts of outrage, but I guess even if there's massive amounts of outrage, I'm, I'm, I'm switching to that. So hope you can understand. Uh, how about some more hellos to people? We still have eight minutes or so. Uh, it, it is smoky here. Uh, not, it, it's, it's a little better this morning than it was yesterday. Uh, I don't know what our number is for air quality, whatever, but uh, it's good enough that I feel comfortable being out here. And I know many of you are still totally socked in and, and we, can, we can all hope for a, a, an end to this smoke stuff uh, in the next few days, four or five days. Hard to know how, how much to get your hopes up. Oh yeah, hellos. Mark from uh, Whidbey Island and uh, Shindy from uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. Wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see people in the neighborhood too, but I mean the, the, the distant stuff is cool. Another Netherlands, I just missed that, sorry. Georgia. Um, speaking of bandwidth and everything, I tried uh, starting this live stream using the internet as always. I, I, was, I was buffering just connecting with the live stream for goodness sakes. So I said, screw it. So I'm on data and uh, whatever. <laughs> so if we have buffering today, actually that'll be an interesting test. If we have buffering today and it's not wireless, but it's the data, uh, cell coverage, whatever, then uh, I don't know, that's a whole nother thing. North Dakota, uh, Bonita Springs, Florida, Antioch, California, Vancouver, Northern Ontario, Canada. Hello there, Susanna. Uh, I need a mod and then eventually a Patreon. I understand all these suggestions. Uh, I like flying solo. I, I, I really do. Uh, secondhand smoke in Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> That's kind of a good one. Old Doc Bentley, I saw something there. These are going too fast for me. Rockford, Illinois. That's where I was born. Sheffield, UK. Another Netherlands. Whidbey Island. Ballard. My God, we almost have 500 people. This is so exciting. Australia, Queensland, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Odensee, Denmark, I've been there. I've got a high school friend who lives there and teaches school. The Swiss Alps, Paris, Illinois, Mossy Rock, Rochester, uh, Weibo, Montana, Smoky Tacoma. And now everybody, Put your hands together for Smoky Tacoma. Take it away, boys. Squim, Smoky Meridian, 
Yeah, we don't need a competition here for how smoky, we're all smoky to varying degrees out here in the West. And this is hopefully just a, a little uh, vacation from thinking about that and obsessing about that and feeling super trapped, etc. We're at 311. Is that the air quality? Feels, feels fine to me. Okay. I actually have some good stuff this morning. I, I had a couple of breakthroughs uh, last night, and uh, so I'm kind of excited to share what I have uh, for you, with you, about you. Feels like I'm forgetting to do something here. What is it? That's functional. You're functional. I'll assume that you're functional. Actually, I do. So the audio is okay. Uh, wireless microphone. I'm not too uh, uh, maxed out. I'm not too loud, etc. There's a chance I have this wireless system figured out, and uh, we don't have to think about it. The goal is that I just turn, I just hit a button, and I can focus on geology the entire time. And if that means I'm doing cell the whole time, um, I guess that's what it means. And uh, I'll have to figure out that. Terrific. Mic works great. Good investment. Thank you, the device nine. Train boy. Okay. Uh, I got three minutes to visit with, uh, oh, we got discussions out here in the garage. So Max and Corey, those are the young kids from, or in their late 20s, but they were the folks in Beirut teaching at an international school. Uh, it was dramatic, but they got out of Beirut, Lebanon in late June. And uh, anyway, so, so they're here. And so they're uh, taking our family van, the blue van, and like they've been doing carpentry the whole week to like make a cot and to make a table and all these portable things to put in the back of the van. They're taking the van for two months and climbing at Devil's Tower and City of Rocks in Idaho and, and heading down to Vegas to visit some old friends and climb down at Red Rocks. So it's been fun to see them uh, retrofit the family van, which is about to hit 200,000 miles. <laughs> but uh, if they break down, I'm sure they'll be able to figure it out. Hell, they, they, navid, they, they, they managed to deal with... Uh, Middle East for a year with all that stuff going on. Okay, give me uh, give me a minute two or two to get my head straight, and then we will begin. Thank you for joining us this morning, talking about basement glimpses. Coming right up after the break. Be over here hacking away and spitting and stuff because you can hear me. Got to be on my. I'm just.
A pleasant good morning here to you all. It's 9 o'clock local time here in Ellensburg, Washington. Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I'm your host, Nick Zentner. This is uh, session B of 26 live streams devoted to the exotic terrains of the American West. And uh, I'm going for, I'm planning four sessions uh, in a cluster, and we're in the middle of our first four. Uh, last time, if you happen to see it, I hope that you did, because we're going to build on what we did last time. We were just trying to get a time window established for our discussions about these exotic terrains. And here we are this morning with session B, and we will be doing something called basement glimpses, I'll explain. The next time I see you will be Friday, not Wednesday. I've made a schedule change, and I just discussed it with uh, the early arrivals. So Friday at 2 p.m. will be our next session, talking about the difference between something called the craton and these exotic terrains. And then a week from this morning at 9 a.m., we'll be slicing and dicing and really having some complications. But that's, that's coming down the road. So I actually have notes. As you know, this exotic terrain material that we will be doing, I'm learning along with you. And uh, if I'm putting these lectures together, I can't just do them off the top of my head like I've done in many past live streams. I'm out of that stuff. I'm out of stuff that I know, basically. So we're going to do this on the chalkboard. We're going to do this on the chalkboard, I guess, without colors. Uh, we're going to do this. So it's kind of a three acts to this morning's presentation. And then, of course, as always, we'll do some live question and answer uh, when I'm through with this. Uh, we have sports fans here, and I'm getting lots of questions. Are you going to be done before kickoff? Hey there, are you... Uh, what do you think of the team this year? How are those guys go? What, what uh, Jaworski is going to be going deep on that shit there? You know, we got lots of stuff. We got that, that lot of promise. You know, Rogers kind of a head case, but I think we got some, we got some potential there. Now, I probably won't be done before kickoff. But I don't know. Do you really watch live? I don't watch any sporting events live anymore. I fast forward through all the commercials. So I'll be watching NFL and NBA and everything at Tour de France. Uh, after this and celebrate the end of our little session here this morning. But I'm all business this morning. Let's go ahead and get started. I don't know. Was I all business? I just did that. What was the main message from last time? I suppose I'll say that all fall. I'll keep referring to past streams because these all work together. The main message from last time was that we have this, a geologic time scale for the entire history of planet Earth. We don't really care about the Precambrian, which goes from there to there. We don't really care a whole lot, although occasionally we will, about the Paleozoic era, which goes from here to here. I'm reviewing from last time. Now we slow down, because we do have this time window, 200 million years ago to 50 million years ago. That's our time window. And that's when our exotic terrains are arriving here in the West. And by the time we get to 50 million years ago, it's over. And we have essentially not received any exotic terrains to the American West, especially on this map here, map of the, I call this the Pacific Northwest. You know what I mean, right? But we're now talking about eventually going from Alaska down to Central America. So I'll keep... This will be our main focus because this is where I live and, and you know that much of what I'm doing here is to help me learn finally as much as I can about the North Cascades, which is under my hand right now, the North Cascades of Washington. That will, be continuing, that will continue to be our main focus. But to fully understand the North Cascades, we do have to broaden out and go all the way up to Alaska and down to Central America. Okay, so my point is, by the time we get to 50 million years ago, we're done. We're done with the exotic terrain story. And so we got to always keep this in mind. And I'll keep this time scale handy probably the whole fall. And we'll keep doing this, I suppose, 200 to 50. OK, that was last time. Now, I was kind of happy with how we did last time. I, 
had the chalkboard filled with topics that we did last spring. And by the end of last time, I was crossing off and erasing almost everything. And I was kind of surprised and kind of I chuckled a little bit. Um, people were like emotionally attached to a lot of these things. They're like, well, you're, we're crossing out the Ice Age? I like the Ice Age. Why are you crossing out? I like German chocolate cake. What are you doing? Why are you getting rid of all these things that we talked about? Was it clear to you why we're getting rid of almost everything? It's all too young. Almost everything on this chalkboard is too young for our story. It's younger than 50 million years. So we're doing four live streams just to get our head right, to get our mentals right. So we got our time window. Today, we're realizing that we can't see most of the terrains. We cannot see most of the terrains. They've either been invaded from below, that's the new gesture for today, kind of dirty actually. Invasion from below, I'll explain, or buried from above. Mm. And I will use it for now. We can't see most of the exotic terrains because of invasion from below and burial from stuff. I'll come up with a better phrase before we're done. Okay? So the basement of our region is not visible. And that's not a surprise, is it? Like if you want to go visit somebody's house and drive by or take a tour of homes or something and they go, yeah, come check out our house. Like, oh, okay, I'll drive by. And then you see them later and go, oh, man, I love that house. That's a hell of a basement you got. And they're like, what? You got into my basement? I thought you were just going to drive by. We don't see basements typically. Basements of houses. We see the first floor, we see the second floor, we don't see the basements. And that term basement in geology is used quite often. It's used for the oldest and usually concealed or underground, if you want to think of it that way, portion of the house. I mean, you're not going to build the second floor and then the first floor and then the basement, right? You start with the basement. And the basement is solid. And the basement has depth. And the basement has girth, I guess. And then, you know, it's made out of different stuff, right? You pour the foundation, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start framing with, with different material, typically. So the basement is our focus today, and it will be on Friday afternoon as well. But let's go ahead and get started on the chalkboard. So how is the basement out here in the West different from the basement of the rest of North America? This is a cross-section. I'm going to do this quickly. And this is a little sneak peek to Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., which will be our, ne our next live session, not Wednesday at 6 p.m. Hope you're catching that. The craton of North America is the basement. And it is typically older than 200 million years. So this craton of North America, most of the basement of North America was built earlier than 200 million years ago. And we'll talk a lot about that on Friday. But the basement here in the West is younger. And our basement was built between, you guessed it, 200 and 50 million years ago. So we have a rather impressive line that separates, and it's a quite sharp line in most places, that separates the basement that's older than 200 and the basement that's younger than 200. And we don't call our basement the craton. Instead, our basement is a bunch of exotic terrains that have been soldered together, assembled in the last 200 million years. Actually, actually, right in our time window. 
between 200 and 50 million years ago, we're going to build this basement. So where are we? That dot here is John Stockton's house. That's Spokane, Washington. At our latitude, the boundary, the very sharp boundary, is in the neighborhood of John Stockton's backyard. You'll see, actually, on Friday that we've got it's not exactly at Spokane, but on the scale of this, I think it will work. So we can go from Ocean Shores, Washington, to John Stockton's house, and the basement is all exotic terrain. Now remember, today's session is uh, basement glimpses. So we're going to see momentarily that we can hardly see any of this stuff in Washington and in Oregon. But on this sketch, it looks like no problem. You just take a drive and go between back and forth between Ocean Shores and John Stockton's house, and you'll be good. You'll, you'll visit all the terrains, according to this thing. Now, this craton goes pretty much John Stockton's house to New York City. There's some changes that we can make there. There's some detail that we can throw in, but again, that's Friday. Okay, basement, basement very different in composition and also basement basement very different in when it was built when you made the foundation now i want to do the same thing but on a map of the pacific northwest so this line this very sharp boundary between the old basement and the new basement you know what i mean goes something like this And you're like, how do you know where to put that line? That's Friday. So everything, you know the states, I hope. Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah. We good? So everything here is the old craton. Everything west of this line is the new craton, is the new basement, is the exotic terrains. So to belabor the point, I don't think this is a hard concept, but to belabor it, I'm going to go ahead and do it. This is a cr That's a person standing on exotic terrain basement. This is a person standing on old North America craton. And here's that same story, and I'm showing this incredible mosaic of different kinds of pieces of material. That's what a terrain is, by the way. You know what? Uh, I could use some help. I always get asked, why is terrain spelled the way that it is? And I think I've looked a couple times because I just keep getting the question. I don't have an answer. It's some li linguistic thing or some history of geology thing where somebody in British Columbia came up with that spelling. I don't know. So maybe somebody can find an answer and help me out because I don't want to. I don't want to spend another hour looking for that. But it keeps coming up, and we'll talk about it on Friday. Okay. So exotic terrains, old basement, I think we've got it now. Good. And we will be carefully looking at that boundary time and time again this fall. All right. We can hardly see any of this parquet floor or this fruitcake. And that's really our discussion today. Where do we actually get a glimpse of this thing? And why is most of it out of sight? So uh, this probably isn't going to work, but I'm going to try it. Oh, actually, I'm going to move you. Can I move you without losing the whole? Actually, can I flip you around first of all? Are you still with us? I'm not going to move the camera until I know that you're still with us. I just flipped you around. Are you still with us? 
Good. Thank you. Now I'm going to, I don't have gizmo, but I'm just going to slowly move you. Patrick's here. I'll give you a chance to see the, we can actually see a little bit of the sun today. That's a victory around here. Okay. I don't have gizmo, but this is my idea for today. Okay, so I'm going to hold this kind of shaky like this, but it's Sunday morning. I was just reading the paper an hour ago, and I want to share this comic with you. This is Pickles. Let's read this together. I think I'll try it on this outfit. Wait, you're right here? In the husband chair, Earl? Oh, what? Oh, very nice. I like it. Nice and... What the? Okay, I'm flipping you around. Good stuff. Huh? That's solid gold. Brad says, what the hell is happening? Helen says, what is happening, LOL? Geologically speaking, AKA Todd, gets it. I'm flipping you around. No, it's not mustard. This episode of Nick from Home brought to you by Heinz, established in 1869, tomato cot soup. Do you understand what I'm doing? Just in case you don't, uh, I guess I can't pick this up. I'll, I'll flip you around again. Do you get what I was doing? It was a rare moment of inspiration. Very difficult to understand this comic. What can, you can only see a couple of words here and there. Right? We only get a few glimpses of the first panel. Uh, the last panel, that's the punchline, I guess, if you call it comics punchline. I've never been a comics person, by the way, but anyway. Uh, all we can see is nice and then A. Nice A. Okay, I think you get it. Pretty tough to read the comic when you got a bunch of stuff covering, concealing the rest of the comic. How are you supposed to make sense of that? It's very difficult. So when you go, why is this, why are we doing 26 of these live streams talking about terrains? I mean, they're right here. Just go to one terrain, go to the next one, figure it out. What's wrong with you? Well, there are things wrong with me and maybe with you too, but we do the best we can with the few glimpses that we have. And we don't have the ability to remove the ketchup. We can't just get rid of the ketchup. It's layers of rock in some places three miles thick. And if I could, I was trying to actually get greedy and think of another analogy with this, where I actually like um, invade the comic paper from below. And I actually ran it by Liz. She said, uh, blowtorch, match, I'm just, uh, with the paper? She's like, candle? It's like, mm. But you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna, uh, uh, we're gonna screw up our comics, not only by covering things above, but by also invading from below with magma so this is going away and i want to basically for the rest of our time do two things so that was the end of act one thank you very much act two is what is this and what is this you might be able to guess and three before we quit is where are the glimpses 
where are these magical places where we actually can still see some of this fruitcake or parquet floor? Okay? As always, I'm looking for a sweet spot between uh, slow enough for our beginning students and enough meat for the people who have been thinking about this for many decades and our advanced people. And so at this point, you might, if you're an advanced person, you're like, get on with it, get on with it, quit the games. It's just who I, who I am and it's what we do here and I think it works to get as many people with us as possible. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I think our prop this fall, instead of the spinning globe, is a block of Mount Stewart granodiorite. 93 million years old. Why are we mostly concealed? Why is most of the terrain basement here unavailable to us. I want to focus on Washington and Oregon. Mostly because I know most about Washington and Oregon. But there's other reasons we're focusing just on Washington and Oregon. Okay. There are three main reasons that we've screwed up our terrain basement. And all three things happened younger than 50. Remember now, by the time we get to 50, we have our complete, I don't have to draw it again for you, do I? Remember our all little scraps of things? We've built it. We've done it. We've made our exotic terrain basement. So with your superpower vision, can you, can you picture what I just had on the board? Everything is exotic, and then the line is here, and then it's old North America there, okay? Now we're going to start screwing things up. Invading from below and burying uh, from above. Okay. Uh, let me just do it. One, two, three. three mm. We have some things that happen in the Eocene. And that will be uh, plutons and sediments. I'll explain. Uh, we ha it looks like I'm distracted. I'm just thinking. We have cascade volcanism. And we have the Columbia River basalt lavas. So different color to talk about whether we're invading from below or burying from above. You can maybe guess. Uh, uh, plutons are going to be invading from below. That's dumb. I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Okay? So you're like, I don't know what the Eocene is. I don't know what the Eocene is. We didn't have the Eocene on our time scale last time, but we do now. So in the Cenozoic era, we have the tertiary period, which goes from 66 million years ago to 2.6 million years ago, and then we have the quaternary period, that's the Ice Age. But the tertiary has been split into smaller units of time, and the only one I care about for our purposes and for Washington's purposes is the Eocene epoch, which goes from 56 million years ago to 34. So we'll refer to the Eocene a fair amount, 
And if you're really into this and you remember some of the details from last time, my whole motivation for doing this is to eventually contribute to Mike Eddy's research team. And they're going to be looking at Eocene magmas in the North Cascades and other Eocene uh, structures. Not really our topic. It's not in our window, even though it's close. But the Eocene is too young, basically, mostly for our story. There's overlap here a little bit, obviously. So this is the first main way that we're going to screw up our terrain basement. A little disjointed now, just hang with me. Are we doing OK? Five by, Haley, we're 5 by 5, no buffering, no buffering? OK. Good. So the Eocene, two things are going on to screw up our basement. One are plutons. Do you know what a pluton is? Pluton, like plutonic igneous rock. Pluton, like granitic rock. We want to think blobs of magma. That's what that hand gesture was. We're going to generate some magma down below, and we're going to have that blob of magma invade the basement from below. And if this liquid blob is invading the basement, it's melting the basement. It's in, a, incorporating or assimilating the basement. And that blob is going to get all the way to the surface. And if it does, we're going to have volcanic activity. But the only concept we need is that we're going to screw up some of our basement by having these mysterious magma blobs invade from below and interrupt our comics. Super cartoonish, right? They're not all perfectly shaped like this. But each of these is an Eocene magma blob that's going to remove some of our terrain information because it got invaded from below. Now, these are called the chalice magmas. And I have talked about the chalice magmas before in the spring. And I'll be coming back to the chalice magmas in gory detail if we do another set of live streams, I don't know when, in 2021, talking about the Eocene. But for now, uh, all I can say is that there is an incredible number of these places where we have magmas and volcanism during the Eocene screwing up, by the way, not only our terrain basement, but our old-fashioned cratonic basement as well. And you're like, give me a couple of examples, could you please? I don't even really know where you're talking. Well, locally, um, the Tianaway Formation, Liberty Gold, Ellensburg Blue Agates, you want another one? I'll, I'll do that one here. You want another one? Over to Wenatchee, Saddle Rock, that's 44 million years old. Castle Rock, Stamolt Spires, for instance. Uh, up in northeastern Washington, if you look at a geologic map, you see some pink blobs, and some of them are clearly younger than 50 million years old. More examples. The Kamloops magmas up there in BC. Same idea, Eocene magmas. The Eocene magmas are not helping us this fall. They're eating from below. They're erasing, if you want to think of it that way, erasing some of our terrain history by basically melting some of the terrain bedrock in place. OK? There's another thing also, at the same time, kind of related to the same story, but not our topic happening during the Eocene. And if you saw this summer an interview with, um, I guess it was Ralph Hagerud, uh, he kept talking about this, or he mentioned it a few times at least. There is also sedimentary basins in the Eocene where instead of invading from below, we're burying on top. Still looking for a right phrase that works. So I don't know, what did you visualize geologically for the ketchup? Oh, what an intoxicating fragrance. Ketchup and uh, newsprint. 
What were you visualizing? You were probably, maybe you were thinking about the Columbia River basalts burying things, and that's for sure where we're headed in just a second. But in a way, these Eocene sedimentary units are also burying on, a, uh, burying on the surface. I'll just say that. Burying on the surface. Okay? So, what do those Eocene sedimentary basins look like? I'll give you a couple. Again, cartoonishly. I'll throw some more in that I, I don't think anybody knows they exist, but they probably do, underneath a bunch of other stuff. Okay, what am I doing? Each of these is essentially a grobbin. We have some German viewers. What does grobbin mean? I'm not a German linguist, but I think it means grave. Grobbin. And so grobbin is a geologic term where you have a block of crust that got dropped. A part of your state or province has a fault on either side, and the crust that's between my two hands is going to get lowered into the earth, like a grave. So these what look like railroad tracks with a bunch of dots in between, I'm trying to show you that these are some places during the Eocene, in other words, we've already made our terrain basement, but during the Eocene, we make a couple of faults, typically normal faults, and we have the block in between those two normal faults drop. And you're like, that's it? It just drops? No, it doesn't just drop. It drops, and since it drops, now a bunch of sediment, now a bunch of river sand and, and cobbles and other things are going to fall into the grave. You can continue with the cemetery analogy if you like. Muffler boy. So these grobbins are not only places where some of our valuable terrain basement has lowered, we have Eocene sediment filling the grave. And so we've lost more of the comics. So this is more burial than it is invading from below, but it's not really just ketchup flowing over the surface. It's like, I don't know what, taking a razor blade and cutting the comics, lowering the comics, kitchen flour, <laughs> blowing it in, whatever. Okay? Do you have the concept? And you're like, well, give me a, give me a couple of those. Give me a couple of examples of those. I'll just do it verbally for you. Think. What's it called? Good thing I have notes. The Republic. Have you heard of the town called Republic, Washington? It's famous for fossils. You go up to Republic, Washington, you take the family, you take your little rock hammers and your toothbrushes and everything because of your nor notorious bad breath that you have as a family. We know about you. And that Republic Graben is full of Eocene leaf fossils. Why? It's one of those places where we dropped the terrain basement, we deposited a bunch of sand, the climate was such where we actually had precious tropical leaves that are being deposited in that grave, essentially. So that's an, one example of one of these Eocene things. We can't see the basement, that's the whole point, right? We're, we're removing glimpses already. I don't want to lose you here. These are not the glimpses, right? These are the places where we're losing the bedrock. I mean, 50 million years ago, we had the bedrock everywhere, presumably, at the surface. So we're losing from invasion from below. Now we're losing more terrain because it's being lowered in a graben and buried with sand, let's say. Another example is the Chewakum. Graben. This is our first of probably thousands of times where we're like, wait a minute, I thought it was the Chewakum schist. 
Now you're saying it's Chewakam Graben? Which is it? And the answer is both. So there's a bunch of these names that have totally different meanings and totally different situations, and it, it adds to the confusion. I've already braced you for massive uh, complications this fall. I've already braced you for me being on this roller coaster of like, oh, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it figured out. I know how to do this. And then the next session, uh, I, I'm super confused. I don't know if we'll even continue because I really don't think this is making any sense. So names like Chewakam, one tied to a terrain, one tied to a place where we're burying terrains, doesn't help us. But I felt like I wanted to give you a couple of local Washington examples for both of these Eocene structures. And there's plenty of examples in other states and provinces as well. Okay, where are we? We're, in the, we're towards the end of Act 2 of a three-act play this morning. These other two I don't need to do very much on because we've talked about them quite a bit in the spring. When did the Cascades begin? I'll wait for this one. When did the Cascades begin? We have Cascade Volcanism. Patrick, Evelyn, John Lord, who wants to be on top of this? How far back in geologic time can we go for the Cascades? 40 million years, Yax wins the... Uh, Mark comes in behind her. So the Cascades start 40 million years ago and continue to present day. We still have the Cascade volcanoes. Can't you see them this morning? I can't either. It's too smoky. Okay? So the Cascades themselves are a place where we invade the exotic terrain basement from below. I'm going to do this. The yellow squiggle is where we're removing basement visible to us. Okay? So we're invading from below with the Cascades. Why? We have subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. We don't need to get into it. We've done it a million times. Okay? So the Cascades are not a place for us to look at exotic terrain bedrock because it's been obliterated by being invaded from below. And then I guess on a smaller scale, you can have some volcanic lahars flowing out of the Cascades and burying a little bit. But that's, that's kind of small potatoes compared to the scale we're working here today. So you're like, oh, we're almost done with obliterating the terrain basement? We still got plenty of spots here. I think we're good, you might be saying. We're not good. You know what's coming. We're going to bring in a lot of ketchup. We're going to bring in a lot, a lot, really a lot, a lot of ketchup. The Columbia River basalts, I guess I got to go to the store and replenish the fridge. If we're going to open up some fissures 17 million years ago, we're not invading from below now. We are burying from above with Columbia River basalts. I'm out. If it wasn't for the frickin' German chocolate cake, AKA ketchup on the funnies, we'd have plenty more terrains to look at. But most of you know the story of the German chocolate cake. I'll do it in one minute or less. Probably without even talking. Ah, oh, no, I'll talk. Seventeen now. We're in the Miocene. We're out of the Eocene. Seventeen million years ago, we begin 
this freak show of deep fissures, cracks forming uh, in southern Oregon, then in northern Oregon, then in central Washington. Oh, cracks, that's no problem. We can handle a couple of cracks. But there's incredible amounts of mafic magma coming out of the cracks and doing what? Burying basement. mostly for dramatic effect. If we had glimpses, they're gone. They're under a mile of Columbia River basalt, two miles of Columbia River basalt. At Tri-Cities, Washington, they're under three miles of Columbia River basalt. That's a lot of ketchup. There's no glimpses. And much of eastern Oregon either has Columbia River basalt or something called the High Lava Plains. But Oregon is even more full of tertiary lavas and quaternary lavas that have done incredible amounts of burial. So at this point, it's almost a miracle for us to see any terrain basement. We went from the beginning of this second act thinking we should have terrain up the yin yang, and now we realize, especially where we had the flood basalts, there's essentially no exotic basement to study. No glimpses. Or is there? Yes. Even with all of this stuff, I haven't even talked about the ice sheet coming down and bringing till and burying stuff, but I'm kind of leaving that out. Even with all of this, we do have some places, some precious places in Washington and Oregon where we actually can see. It's a miracle. All that stuff in the Eocene and the Miocene and the Quaternary, maybe it was buried at one point, but it's been uplifted since, but we can actually go and get our hands and our rock hammers on the exotic terrain basement. Are you finally ready to see where the terrain glimpses are? I was going to draw it all out, but it's already quarter to 10. So I think I'll just try this. this I think this will work. Uh, Let's start in Oregon. The green is what I want you to see. These are just rough notes for me, but I think instead of drawing it all out, we'll just do it this way. So in Oregon, there are truly just two major places to get a glimpse of the exotic terrain basement because of what we just talked about. And the two places are the Blue Mountains in northeastern Oregon, now, the Blue Mountains are a general label we will use, but the Blue Mountains in general also includes local mountain ranges, like the Wallawas, like the Elkhorn Mountains, like the Strawberry Mountains. I like barely known names, and that's about it. The bottom of Hell's Canyon is part of this glimpse in Oregon. We're just in Oregon so far. What is this? We can actually see the exotic terrain basement in the Blue Mountains. And we'll have at least one live stream, maybe more, on the Blue Mountain terrains. The Klamaths, which I thought maybe were called the Siskiyous in, on the Canadian side, but I googled just Klamaths, and I guess now we're just calling all this the Klamaths. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I guess if you correct me, I'm still going to call it just the Klamaths for simplicity. So like the Blue Mountains being a bunch of smaller mountain ranges grouped together, we're just going to call these the Klamaths. 
We're down by Medford, Oregon now. By, by the way, do you know where we are here? We're like um, Baker City, Oregon, uh, Joseph and Enterprise, uh, Legrand ish okay mitchell yeah even over over to mitchell oregon can be part of this quote unquote blue mountains area and then our klamath area you know i'm, I'm out of my element just a little bit now down in southern oregon i barely know where the denny's is the klamaths include the siskiyous and probably some other names that people will have for us but we're down with the rogue river canyon grants pass oregon uh, north of Redding, I guess. I'll trust that you know where I'm talking. So these are the two main spots we're going in Oregon. Out of the entire state of Oregon, we only have two significant glimpses at the exotic terrain basement. But we know from the comics that the comics are the entire state of Oregon. We know the terrains are all there, but they've been either invaded from below or buried on the surface. Hope this is helping you see some things you didn't see before. Now this is Silesia, roughly. So going from uh, Oregon uh, up into Washington, I'm looking at this backwards, but I assume this is making sense to you. So here's a glimpse of our youngest exotic terrain, Silesia. We'll talk about it. On the true coast, we have sediment that's been crammed in since Silesia was accreted. So that's kind of burial, essentially, of an exotic terrain. And you're like, well, well, let's go to some place where we can really see the terrains then. If you're just talking about these dinky little windows. Okay, let's go to the North Cascades. That's the whole point. Look at the North Cascades in Washington. Ellensburg, Washington, John Stockton's house, Seattle, Washington. Look at how much terrain basement is visible. Now, are there some Eocene eating from below? Yes. Are there some Eocene graves? Yes. The Republic Graben, for instance, the Chewakam Graben. But I'm not showing those now. I'm showing that we have incredible amounts of the basement exposed, primarily because we are north of the ketchup. We're north of the Columbia River basalt lavas. And this is south of Interstate 90, where I've been filming a fair amount. Rimrock inlier, Quartz Mountain inlier, uh, South Kalielum Ridge. We'll use some of those videos from the Nick on the Fly series to look at that little window. San Juan Islands, yes. Vancouver Island, yes. All of British, oh, let's do it. Actually, before we do it. So here's a very colorful, almost uh, garish uh, collection of, of colors but I'll, I'll just freeze frame here for just a second and give you a chance to make heads or tails. This is the state of Washington. Yellow is a weird color for the basalts, but let's go ahead. So now we're doing mustard instead of ketchup. And there's a lot here that's going to be confusing to us, but my only point is if we look a little bit more carefully in northern Washington, the light green, exotic basement. The dark green, exotic basement. This green, exotic basement. This deep red, I'm reading backwards now. Invasion from below, but in the Mesozoic. So I, when we're in our time window, I'm getting excited now. If we're in our magic time window, we can have eating below, and that's part of the exotic terrain story. This is eating from below. This is the Mount Stewart batholith, a plutonic invasion from below. But the difference is, 
if we're invading from below between 250, we're good. We want to study it. That's part of the exotic terrain story. As opposed to our Eocene invasions from below, not helpful to us. I hope you see that distinction. That's a big distinction. And it might give us, we might need a few tries to really make that clarification in our minds. I'll give you a few more minutes to look at this. this is the Eric Cheney compilation. Eric Cheney, longtime University of Washington geology professor. He was kind of lumping things by time frame and, and bounded by uh, unconformities. I, I won't get into it. But my main point is we are going to the Okanagan Highlands to look at terrain basement. We're going to the North Cascades foreshore to look at terrain basement. We're going to the San Juan Islands to look at terrain basement. It's a miracle, but we can actually see the comics page in those places. And we can actually read more than one panel. We can actually make some sense to a degree of what's going on there. Now, are you feeling left out? Are you in California and you're feeling left out? This is the last portion of my talk. Or are you in uh, BC and feeling left out? Are you in the Yukon and feeling left out? Alaska feeling left out? Well, my main message, first of all, if you're to the north of Washington, There's hardly any ketchup up there. Now, I don't know that much about BC, as you know this spring. But we have hardly anything invading from below or covering at the surface in British Columbia. It's all there in gory detail. Sure, it's rugged terrain, no pun intended, that's a different terrain. But a, a British Columbia, Yukon, Alaska, boy, there's a lot of exotic terrain. That's not a glimpse. <laughs> it's like the opposite in British Columbia and Yukon and Alaska. There are glimpses of cover. You know, that's, I, I should almost d do it differently, this whole thing for this area. I should have the comics page and just have a couple little squirts here and there. There's hardly anything covering the comics page in British Columbia, Yukon, and Alaska. And you're like, well, why don't we go up there then? Why are we going to spend so much time in the North Cascades? I hope you remember the answer. I live in Washington. I'm going to be part of this scientific team working in the North Cascades. So I have to stay in northern Washington for a bunch of reasons. But we will come up here to help us put North Cascades, Washington in context with a bigger picture. Now, if we go far south, if we go south of Oregon, are we in better shape? Uh, kinda. Here's the Klamaths. So, one of our places where we have a glimpse in Oregon. Do you remember? We're in extreme southwestern Oregon and southwestern Oregon and northern California. I always need little towns to get me uh, uh, located. I don't know about you. So here's one little window, the Klamaths, with a bunch of different terrains that we will look at. This is from Marley Miller's Roadside. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. Here's another glimpse of the exotic terrain basement in California. Very complicated map. Bridgeport, California. Chico, home of Angus and Mary. Marysville, Auburn. Truckee, Reno's right over here. Lake Tahoe, you kind of got your bearings. Now pink is a very common color for invasion from below. And I'll stick with that color scheme the whole way. Pinks on all of our maps. I'll probably be doing a lot of colored pencils this fall. The pinks are, if it's the right, if we're in the time window, 200 to 50, uh, we'll embrace the pink. That sounds dirty as well. And then all this green is just what you think it might be, green ocean rocks. So in other words, there are in the foothills of the Sierras here, exotic terrain, bedrock, glimpses. And you're like, well, you're leaving my area out. This is how I'm going to finish. 
My big breakthrough at the kitchen table last night, I usually work in the French porch, but it was even too smoky out in the front porch, so I was working at the kitchen table. Not important. It's like I'm starting to go, I'm too deep into these science papers, I'm already getting confused, and it's like session B. How am I going to find the right level of detail, but also be broad enough to work for everybody? And I decided, I know what I'm going to do. I know how to find just the right sweet spot between super complicated and super easy and boring. Easy slash boring. And much of the work has been done for me. You know, I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to go grab about six or seven things in the, in the grass. I'm just curious. What would fit that description for you? What resources do I have right over here that are going to pitch this to me and hopefully therefore to you at just the right level of detail to really go in depth, but just the right amount of depth for our exotic terrain be uh, bedrock? One, two, twisty board one, okay. Well, you wanted reading assignments, didn't you? Now, I've said this before, you know about roadside geology books. If you're old like I am, you remember when this became a phenomenon, really, in the 1980s. A couple of gentlemen at the University of Montana, I think 1972 was their first publication. They came up with those yellow covered, my God, that ketchup is nauseating. The roadside geology books of each state came out starting in the early 70s and continued through the 80s and probably later than that. And I firmly, uh, distinctly remember a bunch of geologists that I was learning from and working with in the 1980s. And they would say, oh yeah, roadside geology of Idaho, right, okay. It's not that easy. It's, it's not that easy. Like my area, like they didn't even like address it. So those books are, are worthless. Well, they're not worthless. These books are not geared towards the deep research people. Yeah, it's not that easy. No, we know what the role of these books are. It's pretty much the role of what I'm trying to do here. We respect the audience. We know there's intelligence out there. We know that there's not a lot of deep geology knowledge for good reason. It's not taught very much in the classes around the, at least in this country. And so those first generation roadside geology books, all that having a yellow cover, served a nice role to popularize geology. But I'm here to say almost all of those roadside books have a new second edition, and by new I mean in the last decade or so. And they're no longer yellow covered, and they are rich in illustration, they are rich in photos, and they are updated on the latest info that we have in these regions. And so my breakthrough, I've had these books for a few years, but my breakthrough was this is the level that I'm shooting for. I don't know Southern British Columbia. I don't know. I got one for Alaska. Where's that? I don't know Southern California. But let's go south to north. Let me just give you a little taste of more glimpses, since this is, we're talking about glimpses of the basement, I'm not going to be comprehensive here, but let me just give you a few more examples. Roadside geology of Southern California. There's the author. Here's some exotic basement glimpses in the Chocolate Mountains. 
I didn't even know the chocolate mountains existed. Here's an exotic terrain glimpse of the basement in the Palm Springs area. Pink in the right time window and some other rocks as well. You're like, slow down. I can't, I, I'm taking notes. I can't see all that. I'm just giving you a taste. We'll probably try to go to each of these. We might devote a live stream to each of these. I don't, I don't really know exactly. Here, we're doing, we're the peninsular, Merle was talking about the peninsular range, or the peninsular ranges batholith. This, to me, is the sweet spot. And I'll have to find a color scheme if these aren't all agreeing with color scheme because I want us to have some sort of um, consistent approach as we think and as we view uh, maps and things. Now I feel like I just, I just need to finish this out and then we're done. Uh, Northern, California, Northern and Central California. So I showed this one to you. The foothills of the Sierras, that's an exotic terrain basement. Oh, I guess I didn't bookmark anything else there. Oregon, we already know. Pop quiz, what are the two main exotic terrain basement glimpses in Oregon? Klamath, showed you that already. Blue Mountains. The other exotic terrain glimpse. Oh. You got your uh, bookstore page out already. So this is uh, the author here is, oh, these are the Montana guys. Still at it. I think one of them passed away recently. Uh, I've plugged this many times, Marley Miller, the author of second edition of Roadside of Oregon. Marley and Daryl Cowan, who I interviewed uh, last month, Roadside Geology of Washington. So, Seletia is a glimpse. San Juan Islands is a glimpse. Again, we'll probably do a full session on each of these locations. North Cascades, this is probably, I don't know, what do you think, like six different sessions just on the North Cascades? Probably. That's like the bullseye for this whole thing. Okanagan Highlands, including a couple of the graves that we were talking about. I'm almost done. Roadside Geology of Southern British Columbia, Bill Matthews and Jim Monger. I think Bill's no longer with this. Possibly Jim Munger still is. Uh, not quite as colorful, but the content excellent. For Southern British Columbia. And then I do have Kathy. I don't know Kathy. Probably try to email her and get some info from her. More than a glimpse in Alaska. So for me, this arrival mentally that this is what I'm using mostly to navigate as we try to better understand the North Cascades will be a help. It's a work in progress. I'm not sure if I'll just kind of go through those regions at that level and then go deeply into the North Cascades in like November uh, or the other way around maybe. Maybe I'll start with some local stuff and then kind of expand out. Still not sure of that, but I don't have to make that decision for another week. Um, before we turn it over to live Q&A, and before I lose some of you to the NFL or the NBA, or something else, I want to make sure that you know that I've made a schedule change and we're switching to Fridays instead of Wednesdays for reasons I discussed at the beginning of this session. I will see you all next Friday at 2 p.m. 
going back to the concept of terrains versus craton. Okay, let's go to some live Q&A. It's your turn to ask some questions. I'm glad that you're still with us. Popping the live chat out like a boss. Right between the eyes. I'm on top chat. I don't play that game. I'm a live chat, bro. And scrolling back a couple of minutes, and here we go. Matt, I was always wondering how much exotic terrains exist near Warm Springs, Oregon on Highway 26. We'll learn together, Matt. Maybe that's more of a statement. Jeff, the Blue Mountains were the only thing sticking out of the smoke. Okay, I need some questions here, please. <laughs> How deep is the basement? Great question, Florister Humble. Um, I have a, a, a phony answer that I could share right now, but I'm going to keep my mouth closed because I, I really want to get some good. We've got some new seismic profiles that are going through the basement to get a little bit more specific geophysical information. Uh, so I want to give you some good information on that. So hold off on that if you would. Why do grabbins drop? Is drop relative to movement? Thank you for the question, 101 rotary power. The chalice event which has a whole plate tectonic story attached to it. Again, we're not going to explore that with these live streams. Involves thinning of the crust, extension of the crust, to the point where we're cracking as we pull so hard, and as we continue to pull, blocks are just dropping. So it's similar to the Basin and Range Province in Nevada today, which we will discuss next Sunday morning. Thanks for the question. What is the extent of the Swalk Formation and its relationship to the sedimentary grabbins you mapped out? Thank you, Organic Elliott Wave. The Swalk Formation is just barely too young for our story. The Swalk goes, well, it kind of overlaps, really. The Swalk was deposited, Swalk Formation is the sandstones and shales just north of Ellensburg. Uh, deposited between 59 and 49 million years old. So in a way, we're still bringing in Silesia when the Swalk is still depositing. But it's not the Graben thing. So I think the, ba the, the best way to answer your question, and it's an excellent one, is that the Swalk is a little bit too old to have this uh, Graben story. Once we get to the Chumstick, and other slightly younger, the Roslyn, then we do have more of a Graben story. I'd never thought about that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Porter, why are 50 plus million year old intrusive igne igneous intrusions more important than younger ones when both cover up the exotic basement? Thank you for the question. If we have magmas coming up from below during the magic window of 200 to 50, those Mesozoic Plutonic rocks are going to be riding with the terrains. I'm choosing my words carefully, but it's related to Baja BC. Uh, but I take your point in the sense that anytime we bring magma up from below, we're destroying some of the terrain bedrock. But I guess another way to say it is those Mesozoic Plutonic rocks are like their terrain material. I know that's kind of a weird answer, but uh, it's a good one, and I'm trying to th think ahead on how I'll deal with that in the future. Mori Longo, what keeps a grabbin from falling all the way into the mantle? It's just a space thing. We're extending the crust, but we're not extending it, you know, 3,000 miles. So it drops just if there's space to drop, but it's, it's, uh, and there's other physical ways to answer that that I don't know how to answer. German Chocolate Cake asks, why can't you drill through the Columbia River basalts to view the basement? That has been done. So 
oil and natural gas people have been here on a number of occasions in the last 50 years. And they have drilled at incredible expense to try to figure out how thick the ketchup is. And they did bottom out. And they did get into rocks that are older. And uh, some, much of that is uh, private information, not available publicly. There is some drill hole information available. And I don't know, maybe I should look into that a little bit for Friday. Um, I should do that. I should see if there's obvious terrain material instead of Eocene. Remember, if we're, if we're in one of the Eocene from below or a graben from below that's not going to help us with the terrain stuff. But if you're drilling through the basalts and you get into a terrain, that would be a nice little data point. I think we have a few of those. That's a great question. I'll, I'll try to I'll tr I'll put, put that on my list for Friday. Uh, a bunch of questions here. Thank you for all your interest. Uh, we'll go just a few more minutes. Steptoe Butte coming on Friday. Mount Shasta subduction story, uh, way too young for the topic today. Why no terrains in the last 50 million years? We'll get into that. We'll reconstruct ocean plates. Is there an Idaho roadside geology? Yes, there is. A couple of them. Uh, it's too far east for our terrain story, but... There's a brand new roadside for Montana that just came out last month by Rob Thomas. And uh, uh, I can't, I don't know who did the Idaho one. There's one for Southern Idaho by Sean Wilsey. Why are there so many grobbins in Washington? It's more than just Washington, Chris. This grobbin thing and this, this Eocene blobby stuff is is all through many states and provinces even. So it, again, too young for our focus this fall, but it's, it's an interesting thing that I'm, I'm just learning more and more about. Lindsay, does uplift play a role in the exotic terrains? For sure. One example, and we'll revisit this concept, is that it's, everyone assumes that at some point, uh, the Cascades buried all the exotic terrain basement. But since there's been so much uplift in northern Washington recently, much of that cascade cover, ketchup, has been removed. And so we can see a lot of exotic terrain basement just to the north and south of Mount Baker, for instance, that you just can't see in southern Washington. So there's way more cascade cover in the south than there is in northern Washington. So uplift is a big story. Three more and we're done. Why is BC devoid of fissure ketchup? Uh, well, there are some flood basalts in BC. I still haven't learned much about them. So there are some fissures and there is some flood basalt, but not nearly the scale of this. And I really don't know what I'm talking about now, but most are tying all this to the Yellowstone story, hotspot. And I know there is some kind of hotspot story up in BC, but I, I don't think it's near the scale of fissures and area buried. But again, I might be out to lunch. Two more. Are exotic terrains leftovers from our subduction zone? Yes and no. And we'll get into all, I think one thing I definitely want to do with this series, I don't know when we'll start, is I think it's important for us to go to these terrains and just lay out some facts. And that sounds, of course you would, but I think that needs to be separate from, this is from an island arc and the trench was here and then the subduction was going this way and the thing was moving from wherever. There's so much disagreement and different kind of ideas about that, that that's where it's going to get super complicated for us. But I think it's important. I think I decided right now. I think it's important for us to just go and collect the best info that we have from each of these glimpse locations. And that's not going to change. Those are, those are facts. 
And then we can feel comfortable then saying, well, this is a subduction related thing. This is not. This is a hotspot generated thing. This is a coral reef from wherever. You know what I mean? I think we need to do that, lay it out that way. There's so many questions here. Wow, I'm, I'm really excited that you have this much interest, uh, but I do want to wrap up. Uh, why is northern exotics more linear and not so obviously chopped up? The, chop, the slicing and dicing comes uh, next Sunday. I'll put, I'll put you off. We'll finish with one here. That's how we'll finish. Kurt says, what is the difference between terrain, T-E-R-R-A-N-E, and terrain, T-E-R-R-A-I-N-E? And I would add the word terrain, T-E-R-R-A-I-N. I need help. Somebody help me out. The origin of those words whatever. Starting to get smoky. A toast to you. Thank you for joining us here in the backyard this morning. Here's to your health. Here's to the health of your parents and your grandparents and your aunts and your uncles. Here's to the health of your children, and your nieces, and your nephews, and your grandchildren, and your great-great-grandchildren. Here's to their health, physical and mental health. Thanks to all the wonderful people who have been chipping in with all of these challenges that we've had around the world in 2020 and we'll continue to have, but we'll do our best to stay positive, focus on all the love that we have for each other. Here's to us. I'll see you next time, Friday afternoon, 2 p.m., here in the backyard, hopefully, with clear skies. We can hope, can't we? And then, if that doesn't work for you, I hope that you can watch the replay, because each of these sessions are going to build on the last. And so next Sunday morning, and this is our reg regularly scheduled time, probably for the rest of the fall, although who knows. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you joining us. Have a good week. We'll see you Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. Goodbye.